Good evening, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. First, a great thank you to all of you, because it was a very active day with a lot of interaction. Now we are at the end of the first day of, uh, of this um, World Economic Forum on Africa, and it's a privilege to welcome here presidents, prime ministers of African countries and to solicit their uh, opinions, to ask for, to a certain extent, also for their impressions and their um, take up uh, during the discussions of today. I have the great pleasure, and I will do it in, uh, I was thinking uh, for a long time how I should do it in, in a good protocolary way. <laughs> and at the end, I, I, I decided I do it in the sequence, in the alphabetic sequence of the country. Okay. So um, I start with uh, Botswana, President Masisi, <laughs> Um, then the Prime Minister of uh, Estwatini, Prime Minister uh, Lamini, uh, the <coughs> President of Ethiopia, President Zewte, uh, the President of Namibia, President Gangob, the President of the Seychelles, President Four, the President of our host country, South Africa, Cecil Ramaphosa, the President of Zimbabwe, President Mangangwa, and the Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations, Amina Mohamed. So I will have, I will start the, the discussion with one question to each of you. There was a lot of discussion about uh, African, um, uh, now as a rising content, as a much more integrated content in a fractured world. Now, my question to you is, what is the next important, necessary step to strengthen African unity? President Ramaphosa, would you like to start? Oh, okay. I yeah. thought you were doing it alphabetically. Now, now, now I'm doing it according to the <laughs> Well, there are quite a number of steps that we should take, and we have, as a continent, taken a number of really good steps. We've uh, strengthened and refashioned the African Union, which is our integration governing body, it has become more cohesive, much stronger, functions much more effectively, and has taken really forward-looking and visionary decisions. It's adopted Agenda 2063, which sets out the policy vision for the continent and sets out a clear roadmap of where the continent should be by 2063, and every country on the continent is working towards fulfilling and achieving the goals that have been set out in that uh, roadmap document. The second part is, is taking important decisions to take to address some of the challenges that we have had, peace being one of them, taken a clear decision to silence the guns on the continent by 2020. We've got a year to go, there are still guns blazing, but not as many as we, had, we used to have in the past. So we're working feverishly to silence those guns, but another important part of 2063 is to foster economic development but the most important decision, I guess, which shows the economic forward-looking path is the adoption of the Africa Free Trade Area Agreement, which has been embraced and adopted by 
most of the countries on the continent, and each one is ratifying. And uh, the launch of that free trade area agreement is going to be the greatest opportunity for economies on the continent to generate growth through trade, generate industrialization of their economies, the manufacturing base, and to provide employment for the burgeoning youth dividend that we have. The young people of our continent are now going to be able to thrive and benefit as growth is propelled forward, and they will be able to capture a greater future as we implement the free trade area. And I guess, as I conclude, the integration becomes much closer, cohesion is fostered in all the regional blocks on the continent, the five regional blocks, and as they lead up to the full region of the African continent through the free trade area agreement, it just becomes a wonderful virtuous cycle that is going to engulf the whole continent to growth. So that is what we should capture, and as we also confront and embrace the fourth industrial revolution, that is going to catapult us to higher levels of growth. That's where I believe the continent belongs, and it belongs in the minds and the hearts of the young people who the continent has in great number. That's where we are going. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Deputy Secretary General, I will come back to you at the, at the very end. Mr. President. Thank you very much. Um, I think in addition to what uh, President Ramaphosa has said, it's important that uh, the very next steps that we take to concretize our commitment to Africa following um, our um, signing of the AFCTA is to ensure that we build sufficient capacity within the five RECs to, at the very beginnings, apply and implement the requirements necessary to free trade. So start from the center, wherever the center is for those countries that are in the RECs, and particularly those RECs such as ours, SADC, which has among some of our members a customs union like the South African Customs Union. Uh, we'd need to remove all the barriers, put in the enablers to facilitate free trade beginning in our neighborhood and then going out. Second is we need to recommit to the financing of critical infrastructure to enable such trade. Our airports, air systems and regulations, or air spaces, our harbors, ports, and railway lines. And lastly, we need to commit as leaders to rapidly and with urgency train, reorient, put in an agile position those of our public servants and those in the private sector whose work would include facilitation of trade to be so postured. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. President uh, Angob. My turn to the Prime Minister um, uh, uh, from Eswatini. Prime Minister Tlamini. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Chairperson. Um, uh, over and above what uh, the two presidents have, uh, have shared, uh, I think what we need uh, uh, to do as Africa uh, very quickly uh, is uh, focusing on the implementation, execution of the key frameworks uh, that have been approved by the heads of state at the African Union level. Um, uh, but underlying that uh, is um, embracing technology um, uh, to make sure that uh, all the solutions and the innovation uh, that we are driving across the continent is informed by technology, because technology has 
uh, has uh, helped the continent to leapfrog. Uh, if you look at the mobile telecommunications, for instance, uh, in my country, we now have close to 90% financial inclusion because we launched the uh, mobile money in 2011. Uh, and that's, I think, it's what we need to focus on very quickly. Uh, and the other issue which is key is that uh, um, Africa has a population uh, that uh, makes up 14% at the moment in 2050. Uh, it's projected to be 20% of the world population. Uh, and what's unique about it is it's youthful. Therefore, the important thing for us as a continent is to invest in our young people, make sure that the education systems are aligned and preparing them for the future, um, as well as uh, uh, empowerment of women. Uh, you know, I learned uh, uh, that if you include women in, in leadership, in your team, uh, the level of intelligence increases. Uh, so <laughs> it's important that we, uh, as a continent, we are as inclusive as possible, um, make sure that our women, uh, young people, uh, are part of the solution, uh, and I think uh, we should be on the right track. Thank you. Thank you very much. Madam President. Thank you very much. Um, I agree with that, what has been said. You know, when we created the, Af the Organization of African Unity back in 1963, there is something which has been on the roadmap since that time, and this is integration. I think it's high time for us to really move forward in a more forceful way um, in this integration process. We have decided to dedicate one summit for integration, and it has started this year. I think this is the place where we can reinforce our regional economic commissions. We discuss, you know, in details how the CFTA, which is a huge achievement at the African Union, can be cascaded and be really tangible. We will have actions on the ground. We have to domesticate and so on. So it cannot remain just at the AU level or all heads of state level. It has to be cascaded in all the countries, domesticated and so on. So this integration process that we have started will have to be really reinforced. This is the one thing I see which is very important to me moving forward. But at the same time, you know, there are other things that will impact this, the global trend, the, the, the international trend and that uh, the impact on Africa. In the 90s, there was a discussion, I don't know exactly which year, uh, the Af OAU, where we discussed during you know, the fall of the Berlin Wall and so on, to see the impact on the continent. I think this is also a conversation that we should have, especially now, where it is very critical to see how we have to take this continent forward. Thank you. Thank you, my, uh, Madam President. Now, as the President of Namibia. Well, thank you. Uh, others have already covered enough ground. And I would like to go by first saying that we must strengthen our government, governance architecture by being inclusive in governance, because exclusivity spells conflict. Inclusivity spells harmony. So at home, before we go to other parts of Africa, we must have that governance architecture in place. Then we have tra transparency, accountability, we create trust. Trust in us politicians sometimes is going low. So to be trusted by people again, we must be transparent and accountable. Then there are, after that, might be a question of big guys. It will be now the processes, systems, and institutions. So even, even if I'm gone, the country doesn't fall. So that way you leave the processes, systems, and institutions. Then you go to Africa. We have a basis of OAU, which was there to free Africa, which I did. It is based on a state-to-state -state basis. Now we have the AU, more transformational, I would say, but AU was, AU was transactional. 
the free Africa. But the AU transformational, we have the parliament trying to come to people like in away from the state to state actions only. And then when you involve people, ECOSOC also comes in there where even diaspora is being mentioned. So Africa to unite, we must strengthen our front and then we go out and implement what we decide on. We had all these decisions took about SATEC, uh, economic, uh, what is it, um, monetary union, dates were set, then we went to tripartite, then we went to the continental. But are we implementing all of them? So implementation is the key, everything we do. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, President Four from Seychelles. Yeah. Uh, thank you, thank you. you know, I believe we need to deepen the reform that we are, we are doing uh, to better reflect the need for Africa to, to have what is necessary in terms of good governance, transparency, accountability, and the rule of law. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, to conclude, uh, President Nangakawa from Zimbabwe. Thank you. In my view, I, I'm in agreement with um, my colleagues. But I think we, as Africa leadership, we must know where we want to go and what we want to achieve. Then there must be political will across the board to achieve that objective. The AU which is there today is there because the founding fathers had political will to achieve the unification of Africa into one body. Going forward, it is my view that um, we need to have, to give more attention to intra-trade, intra-development within Africa before we look outside. Once we have done that, I believe we will have done our best to average our economies in terms of development. But to do so, it is necessary, in my view, that uh, our institutions of higher learning, we should have innovation hubs in those institutions so that the young people, like those who have been speaking in the morning, can exhibit their talent at those uh, uh, innovation hubs across the board. And then we adapt technologies developed in that manner. I thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Now, uh, Deputy Secretary General, you have the outside, inside view, if I may say so. What, what do you make out of all those statements? Is, is Africa really on the track for fast, um, uh, stronger uh, Pan-African cooperation? Thank you. Yes, I do. I mean, what I'm hearing now from our heads of state and government is that we have the tools so we don't have to reinvent them um, from uh, the, the uh, frameworks of 2063 and the others that are really important to give an enabling environment. And that includes bringing that um, better coordination and cohesion um, of the African Union to, to try to do this together. So I, I think that, that has been said clearly. Also, the vehicles have been underscored, the RECs, the public and the private sector, public institutions and private institutions as well. It seems that we are stuck on the implementation. There's a commitment to do that, but it will not be Africa alone that will be able to deliver on implementation. If we really are saying that multilateralism and international cooperation um, have a future, then Africa also has a right to that international cooperation. And I see that whether we talk about capacity building, um, connecting for critical infrastructure, uh, the resources for that have to come from within, but also the scale at which we have to do that to make the CFTA work will need far more investments. The digital um, opportunity for leapfrogging also requires investments. Um, and so, so does the education systems that we have, which also have to be repositioned. I mean, we need a rebirthing of um, the, the education 
for the 21st century. Um, implementing youth policies. I think here everyone has said how central young people are, especially women, um, to uh, the opportunity for um, Africa's uh, 2063 agenda. But we have to act on those policies. That requires quite a bit of, um, uh, quite a bit of investment. Um, I think the here, speaking to an international community, um, governance is always the flag that is raised for Africa. And today, I think we know that we have a universal governance issue. And so this applies both to Africa, but to the rest of the partners that we have throughout the world. So it is a universal agenda and a universal obligation and responsibility. Accountability, transparency, uh, the inclusive nature of what we want to, to do and the rule of law. I would end by saying that to have what is missing from here is a honest and robust conversation with the international financial system and how we are going to address those resources that are needed um, in a way in which we can do um, the leapfrogging, the investments, the realizing um, the, the, the opportunities for Africa. Uh, FDI is required. There is no two ways about that. But how do we unlock the resources that we do have? Um, and I think that this is, this is a conversation that needs to be had. Maybe it's not in a forum like this because I think we've had enough conferences about how we're going to finance development moving from billions to trillions, the financial system, something's got to click that unlocks those resources to work for what all intents and purposes we've seen in the UN, Africa has ticked all the boxes you've asked them to tick. And I think now we have to find that, that opening, opening it up. On the other side, it has been said that we have resources um, through um, a lack of taxation, illicit flows, uh, for one flow to go out of the continent, it's got to land somewhere. And I know that we've had lots of opportunities to say we can see where those resources are. Can we begin to return them to invest them in um, African development um, on the continent? Uh, so the tools are there, the vehicles are, the will to implement is there. But I think the international partnership and cooperation now has to come together to make this work. Deputy Secretary General, you, you mentioned leapfrogging the need uh, to attract investments, embracing the fourth industrial revolution. Those are all elements of a successful, I would say, economic policy today, uh, necessary for each country in a more and more competitive world. So my question, my next question uh, to the presidents would be, what do you consider um, the most, the single most important action which, in your opinion, still should be taken in order to uh, generate true, sustained, uh, strong growth in your country. And you are addressing here, I, I, I would say, uh, you are addressing here um, uh, people who really have also the capital to invest in your country. So what do you promise them, what you will do as a next step to make their lives a little bit easier? And so they don't have sleepless nights. President Ramaphosa, what? Well, there are a couple of things that we need to do to make ourselves attractive to potential investors. I mean, clearly, <clears throat> we need to strengthen governance. The institutions in our own countries need to be strengthened we need to address the problem that has always beset the continent, which is corruption. We need to rid our countries of corruption, maladministration, and to reposition our countries as countries that can be attractive to investors. Having done that, we then need to facilitate the ease of doing business. Companies must know that they can come to any of our countries on the continent and find that they are not uh, bogged down by bureaucratic processes and they can come and conduct business correct, uh, easily. And there's a rule of law, institutions function. But the other important thing is infrastructure. Uh, Africa is lacking hugely in infrastructure development, so we've got to improve our infrastructure, and this is an area that is going to require enormous resources. 
but at the same time with smart partnerships that we can strike with various partners, we can actually address the infrastructure gap that exists. And the other one is to diversify our economies and move away from, if you like, resource uh, complex type of base economies, just the minerals complex type of economies and unleash further areas of growth through industrialization, through manufacturing. I think of, you know, country like our South Africa. South Africa, to a large extent, is still based on mineral complex, but we've utilized that mineral endowment that we had to develop uh, the in industry, in a number of industries, and to build a manufacturing base, which we are seeking to revamp now. And I guess the rest of the continent also needs to do that. And with that, we'll be able to attract foreign direct investment. And that's what is needed most as we try to skill young people on our continent, as we try to empower the women on our com continent and unleash the power and the energy that resides in that part of our population, young people and women, uh, to become economically active. And lastly, I would think small, medium enterprises need also to be properly empowered to have access to markets and to have the way of being able to operate. And if we can do all of these things, economic development on our continent can really ramp up to a much higher level. And I believe that we have the capability to do it. The early signs that we have seen now with our continent being the fastest growing region in the world means that we have the, the way with all to be able to reach for higher levels of growth. And what we need finally is partnerships, working partnerships, smart partnerships with the rest of the investing world and also developmental agencies that can come and buttress what we are doing on the continent. The future is great. It looks very bright for the African continent. And if there ever was a time when Africa can definitely be said to be on the rise, this is the time. So this is Africa's century, and we want to utilize it to good effect. Thank you. Mr. President, I, uh, I'm a Fosa, I, I would like to, to uh, follow up with one question. You mentioned at the very beginning of your statement uh, corruption. What is the most uh, important or how, what, what is the best step uh, to stamp out corruption? Well, I guess. We need to strengthen institutions. In our own country, we've been facing a challenge, a huge challenge of what we call state capture, where certain business interests working together with a, a number of other people, politicians, civil servants, captured the state, weakened certain institutions in the country, particularly state-owned enterprises, and also weakened in, important institutions such as the tax collection office, such as the prosecutorial office, and also in a weekend, you know, the police service. And those were targeted, including state-owned enterprises, and they were weakened. And the important thing is to strengthen those, but also to ensure that there is accountability, that there is consequence management where those who are found to be guilty of having participated in corrupt activities, there should be consequences. And let me immediately say, we have found that corrupt activities are not only embarked upon by people in, say, the state sector. We found that businesses, including, including underlying internationally based businesses, who have the, the, the best names in the world, the best pedigrees, they also saw a gap and participated 
in the corruption that we have experienced in our country, which we are trying to entangle. But in our case, importantly, we establish commissions of inquiry, which are still underway, which are just unraveling a lot of bad things that happened in the past. So importantly, governments must be brave enough to countenance the issue of corruption, rid their countries of corruption, because corruption in the end is stealing from the poor. It is stealing the resources that should ordinarily go to the people of the country. And there should be consequence management, there should be jail time for those who are found to have uh, participated in corrupt activities. And that's it. Once we can do that, the other parts are much easier. We then deal with policy matters and implement policies that will lead to the benefit of the economy and the ordinary people in a country. That, to me, is the bottom line. Thank you. You see the support you are getting from the audience. Um, President Masisi, what is for you the most important element now in strengthening the economy? Thank you very much. Um, very briefly, I think it's important in the case of Botswana to accelerate the reforms that we have begun just over a year ago. And those reforms really revolve around opening up the economy, mm. ensuring that there's confidence built into it through transparent systems, a strengthening of the rule of law, and ensuring that there are quick settlements to disputes. Quick, efficient, fair settlement to disputes. It also involves, as you reform, opening up opportunity and space for the private sector to participate. But because we're a development, developing country, we need to roll out connectivity. So we have the backbone. We want to connect every household, every business, sooner than yesterday. And for that, we're training young people, and they're going to get themselves jobs to do that. So we want to accelerate this. We just delayed a little bit because we're campaigning right now, but it'll be over soon, and we'll get on with it. So um, after we connect as many people as we can, we also want to finance the most promising startups, strategically identified, consistent with our priorities that are informed by our comparative advantages, knowing what our neighbors do, knowing what our partners do, and knowing what we do and what we can do best. And finally, we want to take as many of these young people to market as quickly, as efficiently as possible. Thank you. And, um, <clears throat> We had today a discussion, and um, to have connectivity in your country, we should also look at the distances, for the, uh, which are enormous. So yes. you have a special, a special challenge here yes. in this respect. Yes. Um, Prime Minister Tlamini. Uh, yeah. oh, thank you, Chair. Um, uh, um, my view is that uh, um, we need to uh, strengthen uh, leadership. Uh, we do need strong uh, visionary, visionary and ethical leadership. Uh, it makes all the difference. Uh, you know, Chinua Chebe once said, you know, Africa doesn't have a problem with resources. Uh, it is endowed with all sorts of resources. The problem in this continent is leadership lack of proper leadership. So I think that to me is critical. Uh, the second thing is um, uh, education um, that is preparing our young people 
for the future. Um, we are talking about the fourth industrial re revolution. It is important that the education system should be structured such that it prepares uh, young people, uh, gives them the right skills to compete with the rest of the world in the future. So the review of the education system is very important. Um, the other issue is um, improving the environment for ease of doing business, um, which I think is, is extremely important. And governance as has been uh, 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 highlighted uh, by the presidents. Um, and the entrepreneurial culture to be cultivated, especially amongst the youth uh, and women, um, and, and making sure that uh, you know, uh, the innovation uh, and the spirit of entrepreneurship is uh, uh, cultivated uh, in, in, in our young people. Um, and lastly, um, in, in the case of uh, the Kingdom of Eswatini, uh, our strategy is that we want the economy to be private sector led um, and government's role should remain that of providing the right environment, uh, right policies, uh, and then let uh, the private sector drive and grow the economy. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Madam President, Ethiopia. Thank you very much. Uh, well, you know what, I agree with what has been said by others, it applies to many of our countries. Ethiopia is in a um, huge transformative process. I mean, in the last year we have seen many happening. So what we need to do is to keep the momentum, uh, maybe accelerate, in fact, uh, and uh, really uh, sanitize the investment uh, environment, enhance the, the, the role of the private sector, which has been really um, minimal in the past. This is uh, very important. And our institutions have to be strengthened, more resilient. But I would like to focus on the capacity. I think that's a, a very important issue when we talk about you know, moving this continent forward on education and uh, skill building. I think we need to re-examine, reinvent, reimagine education on our continent to really cater for the needs of uh, our population. I think that's very important. We produce graduates which might not be useful for the immediate need of what um, at least my country needs. Uh, while doing so, it has to be inclusive women and girls, of course, and also open up areas which has been really restricted, at least in Ethiopia, like science for women. I think with that, we can have the capacity that can absorb any uh, you know, need of what the country needs. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, President Kango from Namibia. Well, since, we are, since we are building up on what they have said, value addition our raw materials, industrialization. Botswana and Namibia have both diamonds and beef. How do we trade? So unless we can add value to our raw materials. And then secondly, investors are welcomed. We have given very good conditions that last time. But problem of investors or foreigners who come to Africa is that they come on their own terms. From now on, Africa must tell investors, when they come, they come on our terms. That's what we do. That way, our, our interest. If I may I follow up with a question, Mr. President. What would you define as your terms, please? What are, huh? First, I will tell you to add value. Let's set up companies to to industrialize our country. Why should my diamonds go out in raw form? Why should these things go out? I will tell them, let's have joint ventures and so on. Let's add value here. You transfer technology, you create jobs. Otherwise, we have resources. You get a GDP growth, but it doesn't create jobs. So transfer technology. Going up the value chain. Yes, going up the value chain. Exactly. Yeah, that's right. 
Now, um, you see, you get uh, support. Very half-hearted. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you, you have my support, pr uh, President. <laughs> uh, President Fall. Um. Uh, thank you, thank you. Now, when I, when I look at uh, our continent today, we have 24 countries that are classified as low income. 21 are low middle income. Eight are upper middle income. And only one is a high income country. This shows that there is an uneven economic development across our continent. What is important, however, is for us to pursue the path of macroeconomic and fiscal consolidation. We have real challenges, but as governments, we need to pursue the path of macroeconomic and fiscal con consolidation. Where my country is concerned, we are now looking at the next frontier of development, and this is the blue economy. So we have, we have investors here attending the World Economic uh, Forum. I invite you to look at the new ways, new areas for us to have partnership so that we can together unlock this huge economic potential that we have. Thank you. Thank you. Pre President Nangakawa. Thank you very much. My country is in a different uh, situation. It's very unique. It is a collapsed economy. None of my friends have collapsed economies. <laughs> we have a collapsed currency. None of my colleagues have experienced a collapsed currency. So we are building and reconstructing that collapsed economy. To do so, we have to interrogate what we need to do, what resources are at our disposal to reconstruct our economy under sanctions. We realize that uh, government is not in the business of being in business. So it is critically important that we have conversation with the gentlemen and ladies this side who have capital. But we must create conditions in our jurisdiction where they can thrive, where they can feel their capital is safe. We must have conditions, which my colleagues have already mentioned, the easy and the cost of doing business must be attended to. The issue of corruption should be fought not only by government, but by other institutions, that the judiciary. You may have commitment to fight or eradicate corruption, but if the institution of judiciary does not support you, you will not succeed. And the definition of corruption I've discovered is also difficult. In Africa, some activities are classified as corruption when elsewhere they are classified as facilitation. <laughs> <laughs> so we need also to understand that difference. However, with regard to Zimbabwe, we have committed ourselves to say in the various subsectors of our economy, what programs should we do to modernize, mechanize, or develop that subsector of the economy. 
if we look at agriculture, which is primary in Zimbabwe, we must make sure that each hectare produces, the yields must continue to grow because we cannot grow the land. So we must acquire technology to achieve that. In the same manner as my colleagues have said, say if we look at mining, we are endowed with many minerals in Zimbabwe. We don't need just to export all the minerals. Those which lend themselves to beneficiation, we should look for technology and skills to beneficiate. And that cannot come from government, but from the people sitting on this side. But to attract them, we must continue to have conversation with the private sector to find out what they want us to be for them to be comfortable. Yes, as government, we must look into the issues of women's rights. But as the question of uh, creating a conducive environment for capital to be attracted into our jurisdiction, it is necessary to know the criteria they would want to see happening or prevalent in the economy. And those are the tasks I think are necessary in my own situation uh, to make available for us again to put back the economy on the rail and grow and modernize. I thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Madam Mohamed, how, how would you summarize what you heard? Uh, very, very investors friendly. Uh, this is really, t that's a tough one. I, I think all our presidents um, have talked to some of the barriers uh, to foreign direct investment and partnerships happening. Um, and what I'm hearing here is that there is a, uh, a need for, while we have leadership, uh, that leadership has to happen at all levels and that we have to have uh, the checks and balances in there to address some of the issues that keep our partners out around governance. Uh, hearing over and over again about corruption, which essentially is the symptom um, of a, a lack of strong institutions, checks and balances. Um, I don't know um, if um, Obi is Iquasile is in the audience, but in my country, when we try to address corruption, her setting up of the Bureau of Public Procurement went a long way to sanitizing our system because that state capture then became something we challenged um, and while we didn't get it perfectly, certainly it proved we could do it and we could work um, with, with resources in a better way. The a huge amount of, of resources that was freed up to do some of the work we're doing. So I think hearing here is that we still have some more um, flexibility to become more efficient um, and, uh, and, and use existing resources that we have. Also hearing that we're the value add, that value chain that we speak about, is important. I think the whole of um, development and the value chains have often been spoken link by link rather than the full chain itself. That requires quite a bit of investment over time and we're hearing here that perhaps that's something that we also need um, to strengthen. Um, what, I, what I didn't hear, but I will um, add to this, is that the, the context in which we're having to work is, is hard. Uh, where countries um, either coming out of a crisis in, into a new dawn, they need support in the transition. And so often the economies are in, in, a, in, a, in dire straits and, and that kind of support as we heard from Zimbabwe, um, what, what, what is it that Zimbabwe needs to do for us to support that transition? The longer you leave the lack of support for that, the more discontent there is in that country and, and the risk of um, failing and going back. The same with Sudan as we have today. We've crossed into uh, a new dawn where uh, we hope that we will have sustainable development and recover from that era. But are we there at the time at which we're needed to support that? So I think there's a lot of frustration about the transitions for that. Um, in many governments today across the continent, silencing the guns by 2020 um, is an aspiration. And that aspiration can only happen if the resources that are taken from domestic economies to fund security, to fund those conflicts, um, uh, continue to increase the way they do. It's reducing from that domestic resource base to do development. And so there is a, 
as they say, a chicken and egg. You're making um, some very, you're making, uh, as they say, choiceless choices. Are you funding your security? Are you funding the health service or education um, or water and sanitation? There are some very tough decisions to make. Um, and then, of course, uh, I, I think here we're all hearing about how we need to invest in what is um, a huge uh, dividend for us in terms of the demographics, our young people, and especially women. Um, and that's where we have. Thank you. We have, we have some time left, and um, President Ramaphosa, you, for very uh, well understood reasons, you couldn't join us this morning. Um, and I know you addressed the parliament, you addressed also uh, young people, if I uh, Now, um, just assume all those people here in the room are uh, 20 year old. 20, and <laughs> see, 20 years old. Um, what, what would you tell them today about their future? Well, I'll tell them that ma many of us sitting here uh, embarking on policies, seeking to implement those policies that are made, meant to make the world much brighter and the future much brighter for young people. Uh, we've got the most wonderful dividend, which is called a youth dividend on the continent, and we need to do everything we can to ensure that what we bequeath to the young people is a future, is a continent, our countries that they can take forward. Uh, we were bequeathed uh, the freedom and by, by those who came before us, and now we now need to bequeath a better future for the young people. And therefore, we need to open up opportunities, give them good skills, training, and ensure that we empower women uh, in our society, especially young women. And uh, I was not able to join you this morning because we are dealing with a, a special problem in our country of uh, gender-based violence, where we've got to address the, the, the degradation of the, the humanity of women in our country by men and so I had to address that. And uh, two days ago, I saw that in France, uh, they are dealing with precisely the, exactly the same problem, uh, where they've had up to 125 women killed by men, and we are also dealing with it. And the young people who had come to parliament today wanted us to give them answers, to give them assurance that they are safe, that they will be safe in their in their rooms, in their classrooms, in the street, and all that. And that is part of the processes that we've got to get involved in to empower the women in our country, to empower the young people, and give them assurance that they have a, a future that they can be proud of and a future that they can act out the skills that they are gathering uh, along the way. Uh, we are fortunate as a country, as I conclude, that uh, at the educational level, we're seeing more and more young women enrolling at our colleges of education, uh, at our universities, tertiary education. We've got a greater number of young women coming to the fore like, like, than we did in the past. So this is a great dividend that we want to exploit, and we now need to deal with all these things that seek to draw us back like gender-based violence, which we are addressing. So we want to empower young people. We want to empower uh, the women of our country, especially young women, to give them a much better chance for the future, which is what I had to address this morning. Mr. President, I think you are your final statement was a good ending of our uh, session, which was characterized by, I would say, by great realism, uh, recognizing the challenges which uh, you have, we all have in the world. I mean, Africa 
is not alone. We, we have many challenges and um, Madame Mohammed could be the best uh, witness for it. We have so many challenges in the world. Um, and I think um, it was not only the realis realism which struck me, but it was also the underlying optimism. So um, I think um, we are all in the same boat. We want to help. See, I'm speaking now on behalf of the, the, our members and participants. Uh, we are in the same boat. And I think what you have told us was very reassuring. Uh, so please join me in um, uh, thanking this extraordinary panel uh, for so frank uh, conversation with us.